And the second keynote speaker is Dr. Samina Raja, Principal Investigator of the Food Systems Planning and Healthy Communities Lab at the University of Buffalo in the United States. Good morning. That was a great setup for me. I'm not a nutritionist, I'm interloper here, urban planner by training. I am a food systems planner, there is such a thing. Um, I'm curious how many people in the room are urban planners. Please raise your hands. Great, I have a friend in the audience. I happen to know her. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much for organizing this and inviting me. The keynote before myself was a great setup for me. Um, our presenter talked about the need for changing urban food environments, and I'm gonna talk about something that might not seem as exciting, which is how do we actually do that? And if we fail to do that, I would argue, if we fail to pay attention to the systems that shape the food environments, we're likely to actually decelerate, not accelerate. Um, so I'm gonna start by first thanking a few people and I'd like to start the story by drawing your attention to the people who are already doing the work at the front line. This is a couple that'll show up in my story repeatedly, so you've heard plenty of numbers. I'm gonna take you into a neighborhood in the city of Srinagar in Kashmir, which is an urbanizing area, and also the capital of the state of Jammu and Kashmir in India. These farmers are growing collard greens, which is nutritious, affordable, culturally celebrated, desirable. It has all the features that you heard about. But yet, people are not going to be able to eat it by 2030. So we'll talk about why this food and this urban food environment is going to change unless all of us do something about it. Before I do that, let me acknowledge a few people uh, who were involved in doing this work. There's a lot of them, but I wanna draw attention to the lab team that is behind the research that I will show very rapidly. And also a big thank you to the FAO Division of Food Systems and Nutrition for supporting this work and IFPRI for organizing this. So the arc of the talk is several pieces. I'm gonna go pretty rapidly, but I wanna point out that there are resources available that you can look up at great length if you wish. I'm gonna focus on the role of city government and local government, and especially food systems planning strategy to do what we were charged to do this morning. I'm gonna draw your attention to three issues. The first is that within the food system that all of you have talked about, there are particular winners and losers in the food system. And many of you are thinking about consumers, and I would argue that the Sufis, the couple that I showed you, are the real losers because they are working double duty for us. They are both growing the nutrition that we need, but they are also themselves at risk, so smallholder farmers in urban areas. Uh, but at the same time, we also have opportunities in urban areas that are um, being overlooked as urban food environments are being transformed or not. Um, many of the policies that we adopt in urban settings are different than those that are adopted in rural settings, and I would argue that in order to do acceleration, we need to pay attention to those differences. So how do we actually go about doing what we were charged to do? Uh, there's several elements that we ought to pay attention to. The first is that food systems are a spatial thing. They unfold over place. The picture of the Sufis that you saw are not in abstract. They are happening next to an urbanizing development. They are happening in the face of no roads for them to market their product. They are happening in a certain condition where electricity or water may not be available. In other words, if we are to transform food environments, we have to understand their spatial nature. The second piece of it is that food policy in urban settings should be driven by people. I get the importance of top-down policy, but there is nobody better than the Sufis to understand how a food system works or doesn't work. The third piece is local governments are where your top-down policy meets the road. In other words, our global efforts are only as good as how local governments can implement this transformation. And that transformation 
ought to happen in such a way that it builds on opportunities and pushes us towards equitable innovation. And I would suggest that we unpack the term acceleration, thinking about the physics definition of it. If we move super fast, but in the wrong direction, is that acceleration? If we move super fast, in the, uh, then what, what does acceleration look like in urban food settings? And acceleration is a sum total of forces. It's not one thing or the other as we heard earlier, and we have to figure out how to tackle all of those net forces. I'll draw on some examples, again, invoking the Sufis experience, but the examples are from both the global north and global south. I'm not sure what slides are next, so I'm winging it a bit. So the examples in the global north are from the United States where I do most of my work, and this work is based on 3,000 counties that exist in the United States. In the US, there are about 40,000 local governments that are implementing and engaging in food systems transformation. They are creating zoning codes that um, support nutrition enabling stores. They are protecting urban farms, etc. The communities that you see on the map are places what we call communities of innovation. But the way that these communities have been identified and are working is actually part of a much larger process um, that I can tell you about. But in short, when we identify strategies, when we identify strategies for change, these particular communities and several others that are not on the list are places where there is both capacity to produce food and a high demand for good food. In other words, local government action has to be directed in places where there is the greatest opportunity. So um, the issues that continue to face, uh, that continue to be raised in urban areas are that we continue to see hunger and malnutrition in urban settings. And as I've already noted, these conditions are worse in particular sectors of the food systems. Sticking to Global North for two seconds, in the US as an example, what are city governments doing? What you're seeing on this slide is the range of places where city governments are actually leading the charge by creating nutrition enabling environments. What I will say about this is the cautionary note that ought to be learned from the US context is that most of these efforts are regulatory, they're not investments. In other words, local governments are saying you can do this and you cannot do this, but they are not actually investing in the food environment. In the global south, we have examples of three different countries where we're working. I'll touch on some of them quickly by examining and centering on the process of the Sufis, as I explained. And we're going to go talk about one particular place, which is in the middle, um, which is at the southern end of India, which is Kerala. It, Kerala is one of the most rapidly urbanizing district of India, yet there, the local government is taking the charge for creating nutrition enabling environments by supporting urban agriculture through its policy and programming. And uh, the district collector, which is the highest level of government there, is implementing the national policy and going far and above what the national policy outlines. So there are, in these particular settings in the Global South that I'm going over very quickly, in a nutshell, a few things that are emerging in urban areas. You've heard about lack of dietary diversity and shifting dietary patterns, but the key drivers for that are, in fact, not the things that most non-planners think about, so I'm gonna put them out there. Urbanization, of course. The Sufis farm in Kashmir is being threatened by that. Climate change, flooding is rampant, including in Kerala. And in fact, arrival of global food chains, which is changing everything. But here's the thing that if there's nothing else you remember, what I might encourage us to remember, is that farmers, smallholder farmers, are adapting their daily living practices to these changes. But you know who is not? It's local governments and urban planners. So in the city of Srinagar, one of the local elected officials has recently announced that the way to move the city forward in Sufi's city is to create more McDonald's in the neighborhoods. 
So this is an invitation to all of you that acceleration will only happen if all of us here in the room participate in building capacity of urban planners in lo uh, Global South communities. I am out of time, so I will just quickly speed up and say, in order to sustain acceleration, we ought to think about these five things. We cannot develop top-down policies without conducting community food assessments. We ought to develop those policies based on assets and opportunities in those places. We ought to avoid aspatial solutions. If we are going to bring food into those communities, urban communities, communities, they better be coming from the farms in the, those communities. Policies ought to be equitable because people living in those communities are the ones who actually know how to make them. And a challenge for all of us is that scaling up is not the answer. I might offer that networking up and building up and nesting our efforts is the answer. There's a lot of resources available that I welcome you to take a look at. There's a searchable database available that lists local government policies for nutrition enabling envi environments that you can look at great length. And then there's a report coming out on food systems planning at the local government level later this year. And feel free to contact me. Thank you very much.